So today we're going to look at asset pricing models, the CAPM, the ICAPM, the APT, multi-factor models. These are the ones that are used in practice for a lot of purposes. So first, just an introduction, a preview, where are we going? Uh, we're going to look at expected excess returns. The form of all these models is expected excess return is proportional to beta with factor risk premium. We use the letter alpha for deviations, for expected returns that are too high or too low. The betas, to remind you, they come from time series regression. So if you're going to check this, you do two steps. First, run a return on the factor to obtain the betas. And second, the point of the model is expected returns should be higher where betas are higher. It's a cross-sectional model. So uh, this is what the world should look like. Expected returns across assets should be higher where betas are higher. Everybody should line, in theory, on the line. Data is going to be some spread. So the data will typically look like the red dots. And we use the word alpha for the deviation and lambda for the slope relating expected returns to factor risk premium. So this is for a general factor F. The question is, what are we allowed to use for factors? What can we put on the right-hand side here of an expected return beta model? What are the rules of the game? How do we avoid finding an ex-post mean variance efficient portfolio? You saw last time this is guaranteed success if we choose as the factor the ex-post mean variance efficient portfolio. And I made a plea for we need some rules of the game to keep ourselves from finding something like that, which won't work out a sample and doesn't explain anything. What does it mean deeply to say we have explained expected returns by such a factor model? Those are the kind of questions we're going to go after. So far, we've got one factor model in mind. It's worth keeping it in mind, the consumption-based model, where the, the factor is consumption growth. Our goal is to put in other factors, the factors that are used most commonly in practice. So the capital asset pricing model uses as a factor the excess return on the market portfolio. So its statement is expected excess returns are linear in betas on the market portfolio. Now, a little digression. You may not have seen it in that form before. If you've seen the cap in before, you've seen something like expected return is proportional to beta with the market expected return on the right-hand side. And, and so we have to connect those two just to make it clear. Um, why does that work? Well. In the case of the, of the cap M, the market return is also a return and should also be priced by the model. The beta of the market on the market is 1. So the expected return on the market is beta times the factor risk premium. And that's what lets us, the, the theory predicts the factor risk premium is the same as the return on the market. So <coughs> that's what the graph shows. The beta of the market is market is 1. The expected return of the market is there. So the slope is the same as the expected return on the market. So when the factor is a traded excess return, as the market uh, portfolio is, then the mean of the factor should equal the factor risk premium. And a second, more, a slightly deeper implication, let's look at that time series regression again. Return equals alpha plus beta on the market plus epsilon. Again, that regression is just here to define the betas. Take the unconditional mean of that regression. You get average return on the left-hand side, alpha plus beta average return on the market. On the right-hand side, wait a minute. That's, that's just our model. We've just run a regression and taken the mean of a regression. Aha, there's an alpha there. So one way of saying the same thing is that the prediction of our model is that the alpha should be 0, and the intercept in the time series regression is the error of the cross-sectional regression, and that error should be 0. Now, this can get confusing. In the time series regression, that's an intercept, and that's a slope coefficient, and that's the right-hand variable. In the cross-sectional relationship, that is the right-hand variable, that's the slope coefficient, and that's the error. Uh, so it, it's much simpler this way, but a little bit more confusing. That's part of the reason why I tend to use lambdas to, to emphasize that distinction. Uh, and also, you can't play this trick for the consumption place model. This is only true if the factor is a traded portfolio. Uh, that's why in doing the consumption-based model, I've been careful to use A's and not alphas. But to summarize, for the CAPM, you will, you will see it in both forms. And for any model where the returns are traded factors, you'll see it in both forms. OK, and digression. Our first example that we're going to look at today is the CAPM expressed that way. And now you know how to translate it to that way, because its return is a traded factor. <coughs> we will also look at the uh, ICAPM and multi-factor models. 
Here, the, the factors go beyond the market return. Uh, they are innovations to state variables for investment opportunities or outside income. We'll have to learn what that means and, and how you're allowed to do that. A third example, one which I want to build to and, and try to understand what they were doing and why, is the Fahman French model that we looked at the, from their famous table one. Here, Fahman French ran returns on, this is the same thing as the market return, HML and SMB. Uh, and then the point of their model was that expected returns, uh, there should be zero alpha, and then the expected returns are explained by differing slopes, B, H, and M, on these three factors. So they went beyond the cap M in this direction. Now, mechanically, their factors were the returns on a value portfolio minus a growth portfolio, a small portfolio minus a big portfolio. Why? Why are they allowed to do this? What are the rules of the game that get them to this and, say, and, and let them say we have explained these expected returns with these factors? Well, that's the kind of thing that we want to think about today. And this frames it very well. This is what's used in practice, what kind of theory lies behind or, or is cited for, for the words in that, in that famous paper. So we're going to derive models of this sort. I'm going to use two kinds of logic, equilibrium logic and arbitrage pricing theory logic. The equilibrium logic is quite straightforward. It's all going to be still the consumption-based model. But what we're going to do, we're, we're going to decide we don't want to use consumption. Maybe it's badly measured. Maybe well, we don't want to use consumption. So we're going to use theories to substitute out for consumption in terms of decision, uh, determinants or, or other things that might be correlated with consumption. And uh, we will use the representation results of the last few weeks. Um, in the last few weeks, we've shown that, that um, a discount factor, which is a linear function of the factor, means expected returns are linear in betas. So once I get here, I'm done. And you know how to fill in the steps to re represent it in alternative ways. That'll save us a bunch of algebra. I got to warn you before we start, this won't be clean. You will hope for a beautiful, clean, well thought out theory, and you're not going to get it. Part of the reason is that we're doing history backwards. Historically, we started with the CAPM, then the ICAPM was developed, then the APT was developed, then multi-factor models were developed, and finally people figured out that the consumption-based model, though apparently the simplest one, is the most general one that encompasses all of these. And all of these got, got used into practice. Logically, we now go the other direction. We understand the consumption-based model is the simplest one, and all the others are, are special cases. But once you understand that, it's less clear why would one go, go do this. The, the defense I'll give you for now is this is what's used in practice, and you need to understand the models that are used in practice. Part of our goal here is, is to learn the language of finance, learn what people are using, learn, learn how it is or was derived, and, and that's what we're going to do today.